A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be in friends. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. It is good to be with you once again. On the program today, we're going to talk with our friend Jim Wallace from the Gun Owners Action League in Massachusetts yesterday. A day chock full of gun control bills at the state house there as they considered dozens of measures. Yes, dozens of measures that would uh, impact the uh, right to keep their arms of uh, Massachusetts residents, who, by the way, already have had uh, their rights curtailed, uh, I think, unconstitutionally. Let's get to a couple of other headlines, though, before we uh, talk with Jim Wallace. Uh, a packed town hall well, was billed as a town hall last night in St. Louis, uh, where uh, residents wanted to talk with public officials. Instead, they, they basically got to hear a lot of speeches, according to the media. Uh, there was, uh, I think, 10 questions that members of the public uh, were able to ask these politicians. And one of the uh, big ideas that came out of this, uh, William Lacey Clay, who is the congressman that represents uh, of at least a portion of St. Louis, talked about a bill that he introduced back in June. And I got to say, I've not heard of this bill before, but it's got the backing, he says, of Every Town for Gun Safety, Moms Demand Action, uh, Giffords, Brady, March for Our Lives. It is uh, H.R. 3534, and what this bill would do would gut firearms preemption laws around the country. Firearms preemption laws are state-level laws. Basically, the state legislature comes in and says, all right, listen, we're, we don't want to see this crazy patchwork quilt of gun laws all across the state, so if you drive from one town to the next, all of a sudden you've got a whole new set of laws that you're supposed to know about. So we, the state legislature, we're going to set a uniform standard of gun laws will be the body that sets the gun laws uniformly across the state. And that way, gun owners, again, don't have to try to keep track of dozens of different local ordinances. Uh, more than 40 states have firearms preemption laws on the books. These are not uh, controversial. At least they weren't until gun control groups decided that they wanted to attack them. Gun control groups don't like firearms preemption laws for a couple of reasons. A, it, it makes it harder for them to pass gun control. Uh, it's much easier if they can go into deep blue cities and say, hey, yeah, pass this assault weapons ban. Hey, uh, let's have uh, taxes on firearms and ammunition because you'll have lots of deep blue cities that'll go along with it. They also don't like firearms preemption laws, I believe, uh, because, again, it does make it easier to exercise your right to keep and bear arms. And they want to make exercising your right as difficult as possible. So this legislation by Representative Clay basically says any state that is applying for uh, any sort of grant from the Justice Department, and that's every state in the union, um, must ensure that uh, localities can pass all kinds of gun control laws. Uh, again, laws banning, uh, quote-unquote, assault weapons. Actually, here, here's the laundry list. Uh, of things that uh, localities must be able to do uh, if states are to receive any DOJ grant money. Uh, so they've got to be able to uh, pass, quote, any background check requirement in relation to any firearm transactions. Uh, they've got to be able to control the ability to carry a firearm in public places or in locations owned or controlled by a unit of local government. Uh, any requirement relating to the sale of ammunition, such as limitation on the amount an individual is allowed to purchase at one time. Uh, any additional requirements relating to licensing or permitting the purchase of a firearm. So you can have local gun licenses, local gun permitting schemes. And again, it could be as restrictive as possible to prevent as many Americans as possible from exercising their constitutional rights. Uh, any requirement that firearm owners safely store their firearms or prevent children or any other unauthorized person from accessing their firearms. Taxes on the sale of firearms and ammunition unless the state prohibits or restricts local governments from imposing such taxes on most other consumer products. The sale, transfer, or possession of specific types of unusually dangerous firearms and accessories such as assault weapons, bump stocks, and high-capacity magazines. Uh, the sale, transfer, or possession of specific types... Oh, I already did that one. Okay. I, I lost track. I think we're up to... Like the, this is, I think, provision number eight now. Uh, the discharge of firearms in public parks and other public places. Zoning restrictions on gun dealers, which would amount to an end to gun stores in these locations. There's no gun store in Chicago, Illinois, because of zoning requirements. And they've been sued over this multiple times. There's no gun store in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, more than a decade after Heller. 
because of these zoning requirements. Uh, and finally, uh, purchasing or obtaining a farm on behalf of a third party, which is a straw purchase and is uh, already illegal. So according to this legislation by Representative Clay, again, any state that wants federal grant money is going to have to ensure that any uh, city within their borders can pass as many gun control laws in those areas as they possibly want. What do you think that's going to do to the Second Amendment rights of tens of millions of Americans who live in these deep blue cities? It's going to absolutely obliterate their rights, which is uh, maybe one reason why the gun control groups have all gotten on board behind this. Now, again, I haven't heard anything about this bill, so I don't know if it's certainly not gotten a vote by the full House. It's been referred to a committee. It was introduced back in June, so Representative Clay may still be gathering co-sponsors. But keep your eyes on this one, and we'll do the same. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep track of uh, how quickly co-signers might be coming on here. But this is, again, preemption law is something that gun control groups are, are, are attacking around the country uh, at, at the local level primarily. You've got the uh, lawsuit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you've got uh, calls for uh, special sessions to uh, get rid of firearms preemption laws in Virginia and in Florida and in Missouri as well. But this is the first attempt that I've seen by the gun control groups to sort of take this nationally. And we'll see uh, how much effort they're willing to put behind it. All right. Uh, speaking of uh, gun control efforts at the state level, in Oklahoma, uh, opponents of the state's constitutional carry law have a deadline of today to submit 59,000 signatures to the Secretary of State. They're trying to get a referendum on the ballot for 2020 that would repeal the state's constitutional carry law. Uh, Oklahoma passed this law last session. Governor Kevin Stitt signed it, I believe, back in February. It's uh, due to go into effect in November. Uh, but you've got a, a lawmaker who I think is trying to garner some headlines uh, who says that uh, he wants to repeal this measure. So he's got to collect 59,000 signatures. Um, a couple of the Second Amendment groups in Oklahoma, I think the Second Amendment Society, has actually taken this uh, signature gathering effort uh, to the state Supreme Court because they say that the signature gatherers are not telling the truth about what Oklahoma's constitutional carry law actually looks like. They're saying that it allows, quote, guns on campus, and it doesn't. The law specifically states that parking lots attached to universities, colleges, and technology centers are not considered part of the campus. And so a legal gun owner can lawfully have their farm in the parking lots of uh, those places. And yet the gun control folks who are gathering these signatures are, are claiming that this allows uh, guns on campus. I don't, I, I mean, I think they're wrong. We'll see what the uh, state Supreme Court says, but uh, it's a moot point, again, if they can't deliver those 59,000 signatures. So that's what's going on in Oklahoma. In Massachusetts, legislative hearing yesterday saw dozens of of gun control bills uh, uh, talked about, public testimony uh, taken by lawmakers. And according to our guest Jim Wallace from the Gun Owners Action League, there was a strong turnout, which is good to see, of gun owners there at the State House. Jim Wallace, it is good to talk with you again, sir. Thanks so much for coming on the program today. Hey, as always, it's great to join you, Cam. And yesterday, it sounds like it was a busy day there at the State Capitol. Yeah, it was it was pretty crowded. Uh, the original hearing was supposed to be one to three, and then they moved the time back to ten o'clock. Uh, they had an initial room set up for it, but they actually had to open up the room next door, so it turned into one huge room. And any any much more people, many more people, they were going to have to go to the big auditorium, but they kept it where it was, and uh, it was it was quite a crowd on both sides. I got to say, it, it you know and. It, Right up front, though, Cam, I got to say, I'm pretty proud of everybody as you know, this is a really hot topic and a lot of people have some passionate opinions. And I got to say that everybody in the room, you know, whether you were a pro second or not, people were pretty respectful. So I, I got to give kudos to everybody. Well, that is really good to hear. Uh, you know, I, I, I think in real life we still have a hard time uh, being as jerky as we can be on social media. So I'm glad to see that yeah. there was some civility in the room. There were also, it sounds like, Jim, some really bad gun control bills in the room. Oh, it's terrible. I mean, you know, 
one of the things that, that we jumped on really quickly when I finally got a chance to testify, um, and I'll, again, I give the committee credit because they, they allow, they always allow legislators to testify first. And, uh, but then they got me right up there so I could, I could jump right in. But uh, some of the legislators on the committee, including the house chair, and then the legislators that testified on individual bills after that, they started off the, the whole hearing with the premise that we are here to build on the success of our gun control laws because we are leading the nation in keeping people safe. And we know, Cam, that's just simply not the case. I mean, how many times have we talked about this together? And as soon as I got up, rather than jumping right into legislation, I basically said we need to reset the, the initial process or the initial thoughts, rather, for this hearing on the so-called success and actually ran through all of the data that showed. And it's the state's data. It's not our data. This is not a success. It's actually an ab- it's just a failure, an abject failure. And we're, we're lying to the people who we're trying to keep safe in the inner cities, and we're also lying to the people who are losing their civil liberties more and more every year in the state of Massachusetts. And um, didn't go over well, but, you know, they had to admit finally that it, it, it's your own data, it's not ours. And I actually had one uh, woman legislator from inner city Boston ask me if we had paid somebody to come up with this report, <laughs> which was pretty insulting, but it's okay. And I, you know, and I said, no, all we did at the office was take your numbers, you represent the state, and plug them into a graph. So if you don't like what those numbers are, then you have to take it up with yourselves. So it, it, was, it was pretty interesting. You know, it, it is, it's great that, by the way, they don't want to hear their own facts and figures. Um, uh, but, you know, it's interesting, Jim. There's a quote that I found, I don't know, probably a month or so ago from a woman named Cassandra Cravasi. She's a researcher at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research, part of the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And she was talking to a Vox reporter And she specifically brought up Massachusetts gun licensing laws. Uh, I want to read a quote to you. This is from Vox's German Lopez. He says, "Um, Massachusetts gun licensing is a weeks or months long process that requires submitting a photograph and fingerprints, passing a training course and going through one or more interviews, all involving law enforcement. That adds significant barriers for even a would be gun owner who has no ill intent or bad history. Cassandra Cravasi, the researcher, says, quote, the end impact is you decrease gun ownership overall. Lots of folks think, well, it's probably not worth going through all these hoops to buy firearms, so I'm not going to buy one. And then you have fewer firearms around and less exposure. Jim, that's the state of Massachusetts saying we're going to make it as hard as possible for you to exercise a constitutionally protected right. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's a very good point because one of the state reps yesterday, there's a bill in that would mandate live fire training in order to get that license. We already have mandatory training. Some of those courses have live fire, some don't. We always encourage live fire, you know, just like the NRA. We encourage everybody to get as much training as they can possibly get, you know, to be safe, to be proficient, whatever. Um, But this particular state rep was really not happy that we were opposing uh, the legislation that would mandate live fire. And he mentioned, you know, I, I, I have a naval license that all, allows me to operate a, a certain size ship, and I had to go through all kinds of training and get out on the ocean. I have a driver's license, and I've had to do, you know, whatever X, Y, Z and prove I can drive. And it was a few other things he listed. And I said, well, Representative, first of all, let's go back over that list because none of those things were a civil right. The Second Amendment is a civil right, and we already have so many hurdles in front of us. The next thing is that this bill seeks to solve a problem that simply doesn't exist. We don't have an accident problem in the state of Massachusetts. And and I mentioned to him that you're not the first one to compare this to driving. You know, Massachusetts, on average, we lose two people to a gun accident every year. Those are usually criminals who are too stupid to know how to safely use a gun. They put a gun in their hand and Darwin has a party. But in Massachusetts, as far as cars go, we only have 11 times more licensed drivers than gun owners, and we lose 400 people a year on our highways. So tell me where the problem is. But you're right. They keep putting these roadblocks, and and a lot of people actually testified 
uh, especially to the inner city uh, legislators that were on the committee, that you are basically outpricing a civil right for your constituents. They can't afford to do this anymore. They can't afford to go through the process, the $100 license fee, the course. Now you want to put live fire mandates, which probably is going to be another $100. So you're actually outpricing your own constituents from being able to exercise a civil right. What, if any, was the response from those lawmakers? Well, usually they, at that point, they look down at their desk and have nothing to say. So, um, but it's, it's a, it, it, Listen, it's a great point, yeah. uh, you know, because the people who are going to be impacted first are going to be the people who have the least amount of money and the least amount of time. You know, I always think about because I came to this issue uh, as, a, as an adult. I, I had uh, fallen in love with a woman who was a single mom in Camden, New Jersey, and started thinking about New Jersey's gun laws and how it made it really impossible for her to be a legal gun owner. She couldn't go through all the hoops and hurdles. She couldn't take all the time off of work that she would need to make the multiple trips down to the police department. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to stop people from exercising that civil right. None of them... Jim, uh, should be constitutional. I mean, again, if you're talking about the government, you know, putting these barriers in place because they, they find that right to be icky, well, governments aren't allowed to do that. Well, it's kind of interesting because when you get into conversations with them, and I didn't address this at the hearing, but it's, it, it's the only civil right that appears in the Bill of Rights that says shall not be in French. Tell that to them. It's the only civil right that says shall not be infringed. Yeah. So of, of all the other civil rights we have, I guess government can, but they shouldn't. Uh, but it, it's very interesting. So the bottom line is when they were presented with their own facts and figures that show that gun-related homicides have drastically increased in the state of Massachusetts since these gun laws were passed nearly 20 years ago, and one of the things they really didn't like was, according to the FBI, as far as violent crime goes, which isn't necessarily gun crime, mm. Massachusetts is the most violent state in Northeast America. And that includes New York and New Jersey. You have to go as far south to Baltimore or west to Illinois to find a more violent state. And what they really didn't want to hear is that our three neighbors to the north that they always blame for our crime are the three least violent states, and they're all constitutional carry states. There you go. Yeah, no, they wouldn't want to hear that at all. No. Uh, so testimony was taken yesterday. No votes were taken yesterday. No, no, we won't see votes. They, they actually did. This was a very rare August hearing. And from what I understand, uh, they were trying to get some stuff done. The, uh, the House chair, respectfully, is a, a major in the Army Reserves. And he just came back from deployment. And I believe he's going to be redeployed again very soon. So they wanted to get some of these hearings out of the way. Uh, before he had to take take off back to Afghanistan. Okay. When uh, do you think the legislature, when does it get back up in full swing, and, and when might some of these gun control bills start moving? Well, probably mid-September. Uh, and this is Okay, why so not long. No, no, but this is why it's so rare, because August is their vacation month, uh, where they're all out traveling, and, and that's why there weren't a lot of legislators there. But, uh, yeah, mid-September, the committees, though, have... I believe the rules are until March uh, where they have to give a report on all the bills that are within their prospective committees. Um, and that means that, you know, they can report it out. They can throw it in a study. They can favor it. They can oppose it, wh whatever they might do. So they have several months to do this. Um, one of the bills that, that may move, and we're actually very interested in it, is the data collection bill uh, that Senator uh, Cynthia Stone Cream has filed. And Traditionally, uh, Senator Cream is not a friend of the gun owners, uh, but I get along with her. It's you know what I do in the state house, and, and we talk. But she has a bill in to collect uh, crime gun trace data, and I've had to educate them, and I did educate the committee yesterday that they have to be very careful about crime gun data because any gun that's traced by the ATF is automatically labeled a crime gun, and there's an estimate between fifty and seventy-five percent of the guns they trace were never used in the crime. They were just traced to determine ownership. But because they were traced, now they're in the crime gun database. Mm -hmm. And whoever they bought them from is now a crime gun retailer. So it skews all the data. Okay. 
So uh, you've got some concerns over this one. Yeah, we do, but we also want more information. One of the things we don't want is more studies done by a university. We don't want somebody's interpretation of the data. But if we can clean up the definition of what we're looking for, Hmm. I actually gave them a whole list of bullet points of things we want to know. For instance, one of the problems we have in mass is the courts. What are the courts doing with these gun cases? Because every time we read the news, it's the fourth offense for a gun or drug trafficker that's been arrested again and has harmed somebody. So there's all of these things that we would really like to know, but don't give it to us in a study. Just give us the data. Because the last data we got proved all this stuff wasn't being enforced and wasn't working. Well, that might be why you get studies instead of the data, Jim. Have you ever yeah. thought about that? <laughs> yeah. 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 Listen, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think it's, it's, again, it's good to note that you're not out there just saying no. You're out there looking for the information that will lead to strategies that are constitutional, uh, that are effective, that are enforceable. But right now, it seems like, you know, a lot of lawmakers in Massachusetts and around the country are not interested in making sure that those three boxes are checked. It's just let's do something. Oh, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I I had a good conversation with the Boston Police Commissioner yesterday uh, because he come. I think he said he came from Virginia. So he says, I always get in trouble because I'm I'm a big supporter of lawful gun owners. But in Boston, that's not a politically correct thing to say or, or be behind. And he is constantly uh, in the media hammering the local district attorney in Suffolk, uh, it's not university, Suffolk County in Boston, because she has been on the air many, many times. And she actually came up when she first got into office, she came up with this whole list of crimes she was no longer going to prosecute because she said they were all race-based uh, prosecutions. And just, what, two or three days ago, there was a, a person he was caught for the fourth time with an illegal gun and, and drugs. And when the press pushed her on his past record, she actually said, well, his past record has nothing to do with our decision not to prosecute. What? <laughs> so, but this is what we're facing. They want more laws on us, but yet they don't want to put anybody in jail. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Uh, Jim Wallace of the Gun Owners Action League. Listen, I appreciate you coming on the show today. It is always good to talk with you. Thank you for fighting the good fight up there. No sweat. Anytime. All right. We'll talk to you soon. And hey, uh, soon it's going to be time to say go Pats, not go Red Sox. I can't believe that Rob Gronkowski held a press conference that he's using CBD oil. (laughs) Welcome to 2019. Jim Wallace, thank you, sir. (laughs) See ya. You know, Jim Wallace talked about the court system there in Massachusetts and repeat offenders. That's one of the reasons why we have stories about the court system and repeat offenders every day here on Cam and Company, because it is a problem that, frankly, you know, gun controlled politicians would rather just say, oh, let's put another gun law in the books rather than actually enforce the existing laws. Take a look at this case out of California, uh, Oakland, California, Tyrone McAllister. Uh, who was on probation for a robbery last year in which a 71-year-old man, uh, a Sikh, was viciously attacked. Now, less than a year after that attack took place, Tyrone McAllister is charged with murder. I mean, this is amazing. This is the estranged son of a, uh, a police chief. Tyrone McAllister and Dennis Evans both charged with murder, according to CBS in San Francisco, for the fatal shooting of 32-year-old uh, uh, Jonathan Liange of Garden Grove uh, back on August the 20th. Prosecutor Eliza McAllister is the one who shot and killed the man. Both charged with secondary robbery as well as special circumstance of community murder during the course of a robbery. Now, media notes that McAllister was arrested in August of 2018 in connection with a uh, attack on a 71-year-old Sikh man uh, last December 11th. So this is a year ago that attack took place. And then December 11th, he was convicted of attempted robbery in connection with that attack and is already out on probation. He's already back out on the streets after a violent crime like that. It's absolutely unbelievable. He's also, by the way, now charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm because that was a felony level offense that he was convicted of and served months behind bars. That's it. Months for a violent crime. Meanwhile, you've got, you know, gun control advocates who are out there 
talking about things like quote unquote universal background checks, which would provide a year in federal prison if you sell a firearm to your neighbor who you've known for 20 years without going through a background check first. Again, this is insanity. And any politician out there who's willing and ready to talk about criminalizing your lawful behavior, your exercise of a Second Amendment right, when violent criminals are getting slaps on the wrist and then sent on their way, I, again, these folks need to be called out for failing to address the real issues that show up every day in our court system. What good is another law or six or 12 going to do when the laws are not being enforced against violent crime right now? Sorry, I'm going to climb down off my soapbox. Let's get to an armed citizen story for you from uh, Texas, actually from Arizona, another pro-gun state. Uh, suspect shot as he was trying to break into a residence in East Flagstaff uh, early Wednesday morning. We don't have a ton of information uh, about this, but uh, they say that a, a male intruder uh, shot early Wednesday after he uh, forced his way into a residence there in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, and was shot by one of the uh, individuals there inside the home. Uh, when officers arrived, they said they went into life-saving measures with the suspect. He was taken to uh, Flagstaff Medical Center with life-threatening injuries. Uh, windows next to the door of the home were broken. Uh, large amounts of glass located inside. They say the suspect's identity is pending. The investigation is ongoing. But uh, right now, again, this would appear to be a uh, pretty clear-cut case of self-defense. We'll try to bring you more information uh, as it becomes available. And uh, finally, our good deed of the day from the great state of Texas. See, I knew there was a Texas story in here somewhere. Henderson County, an uh, off-duty detention center. Uh, coming to the aid of uh, our duty detention center employee, I should say, coming to the aid of an individual whose uh, truck was on fire here. This was, uh, according to Henderson County Sheriff, uh, Officer Jimmy Mosley was on his way home when he noticed black smoke in the air, pulled over to the side of the road in uh, Athens, Texas, and said, I can see taillights through the flames and a man lying just outside the driver's side door. He was just inches away. He was unresponsive and there was no one else around. So I started dragging him. Mosley said uh, within minutes, the truck was fully engulfed. Uh, with the assistance of a passerby, uh, Mosley was able to pull that victim away from the blaze, uh, which had now caught the dry grass in the ditch on fire as well. A uh, person pulled from the truck uh, was taken to a local hospital uh, for treatment. Uh, Jimmy Mosley suffered flash burns across his ear, uh, down his left cheek, on his left arm as well. Again, clearly putting himself at risk. To save another, Sheriff Hillhouse says Jimmy's bravery in this life-threatening near tragedy saved a life and exemplifies the best that we have to offer. So in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing there in Henderson County, Texas, Jimmy Mosley, we thank you, sir, for being one of the many good guys out there. We thank you for your good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Coming up on tomorrow's uh, program, uh, I, I, I'm trying to decide. I've got a couple of interviews that I've actually been sort of saving. I got to figure out what order I'm going to go in, but uh, we're going to have a really good one. I can promise you that. Uh, plus, all of the day's top segment news and information, armed citizen stories, and more. You can find us via podcast on iTunes, on Spotify, on Stitcher, at the townhall.com podcast page. And of course, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media at YouTube if you like the show in video form each and every day. Thanks as always for watching, for listening, for tuning in and for spreading the word. And we'll see you back here tomorrow with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company.